I will talk about several um, spin glass models today, so maybe let me write them down here so I, uh, I won't touch them. So all the models will be some random processes on the hypercube um, in n dimensions. So the elements of this set, I will denote them by sigma, and, and this will be called spin configuration. So the coordinates will be called spin, and the sigmas will be uh, called spin configurations. So the, the main model that I will talk about is the sharing kirkpatrick model, where we consider a random process on indexed by, by these spin configurations. So this is called a Hamiltonian, which is given by some conventional scaling by 1 over square root of n. And then you sum over all choices of coordinates i and j from 1 to n. You take what is called interaction parameters j, i, j between spins sigma i and sigma j. So you have this kind of interaction term for each. You can look at just different pairs, but essentially it's the same model if you allow self-interactions and you include each pair twice. So you can just add over all uh, choices i and j, where these coefficients, these interaction parameters, are chosen to be all independent, identically distributed, uh, standard, normal random variables. Okay? And so that gives us just a Gaussian process, a pure Gaussian process indexed by the spin configurations on this space. But let me notice right away um, uh, one property of this Gaussian process that if, if you compute its covariance, uh, of course what you get is you get this 1 over n. And because these are independent for each i and j, you just pick the corresponding product sigma i, sigma j from the first vector, sigma i, sigma j from the second vector. Right? So that the covariance is easily computed like this, but you can then rewrite it because you notice this is just a square. So up to some rescaling, this is a square of the scaled scalar product between these two configurations, sigma 1 and sigma 2. Uh, square. Okay, so if you square out, you get exactly that. And I will denote this quantity by R12. So this is what is called the overlap. So R12 is called the overlap of two configurations. But basically, this is just the R12 is just a normalized scalar product which normalizes it to be of order 1. Okay. And so what you notice here is that we have this invariance under rotations, that if you take you know, this particular space of configuration and you rotate it, the scalar product will not be affected, so the covariance will, will not be affected. right? So the distribution of this process will not be affected. So in this sense, you know, it's not really important that this process, this Hamiltonian, is a function of this plus and minus one coordinates because everything is encoded just by scalar product between the coordinates. And this will be a very important distinction uh, of this model from the diluted version of this model that I will talk about. Now, everything I will say about SK model applies to this more general class of models called mixed p-spin models, where the Hamiltonian is given by some linear combination with some coefficients of the so-called pure p-spin models, where this so they, they will all be independent over p and for a given p, this is just an analog of the SK model, only you allow p spins that interact at a time. So you will have slightly different scaling 
p minus 1 over 2 here. And you will sum over choices of p, any p indices. Otherwise, you will have the same Gaussian interaction in front of the product of these p spins at a time. But you can notice that also the, the covariance of the p-spin Hamiltonian. It's, it's again a Gaussian Hamiltonian. And if you compute the covariance, it will be of the same form, only you will get the, the pth power of the overlap. Okay? But otherwise, it's kind of the same. And so basically, it's the same class of models. So the same methods work you know, for, for all these types of models. So beta p's, are they, are they just uh, are they deterministic? Or are yeah, beta p's are deterministic. You can choose you know, any linear combination. Uh, just make sure that the sum is defined, you know, that the series uh, is defined. Now, the diluted version of the SK model so Oh, I wrote the covariance of just one, one term. So HP was without, HP was just without beta p. So just this guy. But of course, if you t if you compute covariance of this guy, it will be sum of beta p squared overlap to the power p. Okay. So okay. So if you look at the SK model, you can think of this. Okay, this is a easing model on the complete graph where you know, everybody is allowed to interact with everybody and the interaction parameters you know, are disordered so they can be random, maybe positive and negative, so they are chosen to be random. And what you do in the diluted models, you simply pick a sparse subgraph. So you, you, you pick an erdos renyi subgraph where you choose each pair with a small probability proportional to 1 over n. And as a result, you uh, so what you know. <coughs> then one each spin will be interacting now with a finitely many. So instead of interacting with everybody else, it will be allowed to interact with finitely many coordinates. And essentially, the Hamiltonian that you can consider, you can just apply the uh, Poisson approximation to the binomial, and you can say that I will be summing a random number of terms okay, where this random number of, of pairs that will interact, this will be a Poisson random variable with the average proportional to n. So instead of, of order n squared terms, you will end up with a random number but of order n terms. But each term is of the same kind. So it's some Gaussian interaction. and you have some pair of spins that interacting here. And all these interacting pairs, all these indices are chosen independently and uniformly from all possible choices of indices. Okay. So in this model, that symmetry is broken, that you don't have invariance under rotation. And here, it's kind of essential. I mean, this function depends on the fact that these coordinates are plus and minus 1 in much more essential way. So you have to describe uh, what's going on in this model in much more detail. But the reason I wanted to talk about this model at the same time is because it kind of illustrates how the theory developed in the SK model is useful when you start talking about some other models. Oh, so you choose, so here I already forgot about subgraph. I'm just saying that we will end up with a random number of terms like this. We will choose it to be Poisson proportion with the average proportional to n. And each pair, you know, i, j, which will depend on k, is just chosen completely randomly. So each pair that will interact, you choose it completely randomly from all possibilities. OK, so th these are the models. Now, the, the main kind of motivating question
that people try to study is the computation of the free energy. Okay. Um, or maybe I should say it this way. For mathematicians, the main motivation is to prove the formulas that were invented by the physicists for the free energy, where you take, so you consider a model at some positive temperature, you take inverse temperature parameter, and then you look at uh, this quantity called the free energy, okay, given by 1 over n expected value of log of the partition function, where the partition function, uh, it j you just look at the sum over all configuration, and contribution of each configuration is this exponent beta times the Hamiltonian. Okay. And so the, the goal is to prove that the limit in all these models, that the limit when n goes to infinity of the free energy you know, is, is given by, by, by some formula coming from physics. At every temperature. Now, this is also connected by some uh, very. Uh, can yes. we briefly don't put in a minus in the exponential minus beta? Yes, 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 yes. So, in you know, in statistical physics, you try very hard to confuse yourself, right, by thinking about minimum and then also putting a minus later. <laughs> but I will think of it in a more simple way. No minuses in the Gibbs measure. And we always think about the maximum instead of the minimum. Okay? Now, of course, this is, I mean, th this is also related to another interesting question because y you can see that if you want to compute the behavior for the maximum, so really also very interesting questions in all these models and other types of models like this, is how the maximum behaves. Uh, the way we, you know, scaled everything is so that the maximum is of order n. So if you scale the maximum of order n, you want to understand, you know, can you compute the precise limit? So not only the order of the maximum, but the precise asymptotics when n goes to infinity. And this is, of course, easily obtained from the formula for the free energy because if first you compute the free energy, in the limit, you can then divide by beta and let temperature go to zero, or beta go to infinity. And so the formula for the free energy also gives you the formula for the ground state energy, or for the maximum. And this is also very interesting, because many of these, in many of these problems, people think of these Hamiltonians as you know, some optimization, combinatorial optimization problems of interest. And you know. Random interaction just models a typical behavior for this maximum, you know, for a typical realization of the parameters. So you're maximizing all this bits. Maximizing, all the right. 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 What about the fluctuations of the free energy? Is that still in focus or not necessarily? Well, yeah, there, there are interesting questions. I mean, if you just look at this in these examples, you know, like a Gaussian or even the diluted model, there are some very simple classical fluctuation for the free energy, which, by the way, will imply that you get the same limit without the average with probability one, because this thing is concentrated. But yes, there are, there are some interesting questions which say that the fluctuation of the free energy should be better than what you would expect just by basic, you know, by just basic Gaussian. But uh, in the SK model, as far as I know, that's not, that's still, an open problem. The closest result is result by Shurav Chatterjee for the free energy. So he has a result for the free energy in the SK model where the classical fluctuation would tell you that, okay, the variance of this guy is of order 1 over n, and he has a result that you know, he calls super concentration where it, you get something better, 1 over n and some log of n. Okay. Strange of limits. Here it's it's completely innocent, yeah, because I mean, because when you look at the free energy, right? If you just instead of the sum on one hand, if you just take one largest term, 
everything cancels. So after you divide by beta, you just get exactly the maximum over n. And on the other side, you can replace all terms by the largest one. And, and this will give you, again, the maximum plus 2 to the n of those terms will give you log of 2 over beta. So when beta is large, I mean, these guys just stay close to each other. So it's kind of an innocent exchange of limits. OK, so that's, that's the main motivating question. And the, uh, so a big kind of holy grail was for a long time to prove the, the so-called Parisi formula for the free energy. So in the SK model, The formula was discovered by Giorgio Parisi, or invented by Giorgio Parisi, um, around 1980, which tells you that the limit for the free energy is given by some variational formula where you minimize over this parameter zeta, where, let, let me maybe write right away, zeta will be just a cumulative distribution function on 0, 1. And in fact, it's enough to only look at cumulative distribution functions uh, with finitely many steps. So you're just minimizing over these kind of step functions on 0, 1 going between 0 and 1. And then you have, you have some nonlinear term that I will show in a second. And then you have some simple linear term, which is just an integral of this zeta times q d q. Okay. And um, this, this functional, OK, it's one typical way to write it down is to say that this is a solution of differential partial differential equation at 0, where you look at a function of time variable with time being on 0, 1, and space variable on the real line. You start with the boundary condition at 1, at time 1, given by log of hyperbolic cosine. And then you solve backwards from 1 to 0. You solve this. Um, equation, which is basically a heat equation after some change of density. So you have this linear term, and then the, the, the functional zeta, the, the cumulative distribution function, it comes, it, it comes here like this as a factor in, in front of this nonlinear term. Okay. But it, you know, this representation, it's just representation you see in papers or talks where you just want to encode it, you know, quickly. The truth is, you know, the solution has nothing to do with this differential equation. And moreover, the solution to this equation is that you can write it explicitly because on every interval where zeta is constant, if you make a change of variable e to the zeta phi, you get exactly heat equation. And so you, on every interval where zeta is a constant, you can write exact solution, and you simply have to make a different change of variable on every interval. So you can explicitly write, but recursively. You have to write recursively what the solution um, will look like. So that's the Parisi formula, and it was proved by Telegram. So this was a big breakthrough in, in spin glasses when Telegram proved, proved this. Uh, in 2003, after some important work of Francesco Guerra, which was right before that, uh, where Guerra first showed that you have an upper bound, that the free energy can be upper bounded by, by this Parisi formula. And then Talagran, you know, found a way to push the ideas of Guerra much more, and he, he proved that this um, upper bound is, is exact in the limit. 
So it, it was a pretty complicated uh, proof. Now there is another approach. to prove this Parisi formula where you complement um, the Guerra's upper bound by some um, cavity computation, which is, which is, huh? Yes, but th this, this blackboard was used first, so that's the last. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so another approach is, is to use, for the lower bound, to use kind of a different representation for the free energy. The, the basic idea, so th this is called the uh, eisenman sim star representation. Which I'm not going to write Right now, the basic, the basic idea there is that when you compute the limit of 1 over n log of Zn, what you can do if you can, you can compute the limit of the increments log of Zn plus 1 minus log of Zn. So if this limit exists, these guys are just averages of the increments. So that limit also exists. And then you can look at this increment and you can represent it in a little bit different way and then the the point after that is that the Parisi formula arouse, uh, arises at the end of this computation but you need to prove the predictions of the physicists about the structure of the Gibbs measure so what I'm going to talk about today and tomorrow is exactly these predictions about so the structure of the Gibbs measure. Predictions about the structure of the Gibbs measure. You should also point out that Gibbs measure should not be called Gibbs measure, right? It should be called Gibbs distribution, <laughs> <laughs> which the physicists at the Perimeter Institute really were very felt very strongly about this. <laughs> so okay. So the structure, huh? Well, Gibbs measure just sounds so foreign to the physicists. Either it it's should be a Gibbs distribution, then it sounds more natural. Right? Well, what's a distribution? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so the, the, the Gibbs measure, okay, the Gibbs measure is, is, of course, this probability distribution on the space of configuration which measures exactly the contribution of each configuration to the partition function, relative contribution to, to the partition function. Okay? And so the physicists in the 80s, um, you know, starting from the work of Parisi, and then you know, there were many papers by uh, Parisi and you know, with other with collaborators and um, there was also important work in parallel by, by Bernard Derrida about these random energy models. In any case, it, at the end of the 80s, it all resulted in a very precise and very you know, um, clear mathematical description of how the Gibbs measure should look like asymptotically in the sense that I will describe today. And this is given by the Royal Probability Cascades. And I, I will also describe um, what this means. And so my, my plan today, I just want to um, focus just to describe what the predictions um, are about the Gibbs measure. Also, uh, it, not only for the SK model, but also this Mizard Parisian that's for the diluted models. And tomorrow I will talk about the ideas behind the proof of, of these results. Okay. So today I just try to mention what the results um, should be, what these predictions are, and uh, maybe mention some results for the diluted model. Yes. Tomorrow I will talk only about the SK, uh, SK type models. Okay. So any questions so far? 
So the first thing, to, so to describe what these questions. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, no, ultrametricity, the, geom the geometric part, we, we will see. Of course, that was understood by Parisi with other people yeah. well before. I, I would say that the, the probabilistic part, exactly how the randomness of this measure looks like, you know, they also understood it in some sense, even before Ruel. Ruel was just the first who just wrote it down very cleanly, you know, mathematically, so that, you know, we know it. Let's say after 87, everybody knew what, what things should be like what we should try to prove. Yes, I, 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 you know, some of you know this history better than I do, but I think it was just an interpretation. You know, there were several papers of Parisi with other people where they s reinterpreted the Parisi replica method in terms of the properties of the Gibbs measure. So ultrametricity was not Parisi by himself, but with a group of other people. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing which Ruel added is that there were, Parisi introduced an algorithm of you know, subdividing and ultrametricity was part of it. And, uh, and Derrida also had this algorithmic construction, but uh, what Ruel emphasized is there's a mathematical object which is like the limit of what you do if you keep subdividing it. And that actually is Ruel. And the probabilistic, so they also had, I mean, since it's a random measure, they had some calculation that would give you various statistics behind it, but the Ruel was the first to write it explicitly in terms of this Poisson point processes. So the kind of, not, not just the computation that give you partial answers, but the whole distribution behind all these computations. But I, I will show it today if I have time. So to describe these predictions, I'm going to start by defining the so-called called asymptotic uh, Gibbs measures. Okay, so what this is, the, it, there is a formal way to take this system of finite size and first pass to the limit when, you know, thermodynamic limit when n goes to infinity and then introduce a Gibbs measure-like object in the limit. Okay, and so this allows, first of all, to describe the predictions of the physicist a little bit faster because you don't have to make any approximate statements. But also this is very important because that's how the results, mathematical results were proved in the last few years. Okay, what happens when you pass to the limit is that some properties that you have, you know, only approximately for a system of finite size, they become exact in the limit and so they become more powerful in the limit. Okay. Now this point of view was first introduced in this, at least in, in, you know, in the context, context of these models in the paper of Arguin and Eisenman, which was really a very influential paper in 2007 that started this whole direction of research and tomorrow I will, I will talk again about this. But one of the main ideas was exactly this, that let's pass to the limit, let's define some limiting object and work with you know, exact properties for this limiting object. Now, in this paper, they did it only for the SK model. I'm going to describe a slightly different um, definition, which will also work for diluted models. So it will allow me to talk about both types of models at the same time. So to define this limit, what we'll do, we'll just consider an infinite sample of replicas. So these are called replicas. Th this is just an infinite sample from the Gibbs measure Gn. And then I'm going to write the sample, just to, I will write it out as infinite array, where each row will correspond to one, one replica. So we sample the first replica, I will write it as, as this first array. And since I, I'm going to pass to the limit, I, the array will become infinite in both directions. Of course, here we just have n coordinates. But temporarily, let me just think that, you know, it's an infinite 
um, infinite configuration from the beginning with just some holders temporarily, let's say plus ones. And so you keep sampling and you just keep writing these uh, configuration as, as, you know, new rows, and you end up with this infinite array of plus and minus one random variables. Now, it, it looks kind of, hmm? Yes, I, I finish here, but I'm going to now pass to the limit. So this n will go to infinity. So in the end, I will be looking at infinite arrays. So you, you don't need to do it, but just from the beginning, I say, let's think of this as an infinite from the beginning. These coordinates will, will be replaced by, by, by random coordinates eventually. So for, first thing I want to notice is if I give you an infinite sample from a Gibbs measure on this finite space, of course it encodes all the information, right? Because you can just see, you can see how frequently a configuration appears in the sample, and that just gives you the Gibbs weight. So, you know, just philosophically, very little, in, there is no information lost about the model just by encoding it into infinite sample. Now, the most important, from our point of view, fact is that when you look at the free energy, or if I'm a little bit more careful, I should say, if you look at this Eisenman seam star representation for the free energy um, in, in any model, in the SK model, there is also analog of this for, for the diluted models. So the free energy is a continuous function of the distribution of this array. So if I, if I pass to the limit in this sense, just by studying what the distribution of this array will look like, in principle, this also tells me what the free energy will be in the limit, because it depends continuously on, on this array. So I can't agree with you. You have a continuous function. Continuous function of the distribution of this array. Okay. So if I tell you. If you sample, if you, if you look at the infinite sample, in, if I tell you what the distribution of that array is, maybe I should emphasize here the distribution in the unconditional sense. So you have, of course, you know, sampling, but you also have a randomness of the Gibbs measure. So under all the randomness that was involved to generate this array. Okay. So in the SK model, Actually, you don't need all this information. In the SK model, you only need to keep the scalar products between configurations. That's because of that rotational symmetry. But in the diluted model, things becomes more comp become more complicated, and you really need to describe in the limit what will be the correlation structure for this entire array. Okay, so there's, there's an extra level of difficulty in, uh, in the diluted models. So, okay, let's... Now, think that we, we pass to the limit. Now we have this. So in the limit, what you have is now just infinite array of random plus and minus ones. The Gibbs measure here disappears for a second because you know now each configuration is just an infinite vector of plus and minus one. But can you say that you know, before the limit, each those configurations were sampled from this geometric object, the random measure. In the limit, that object disappeared. But it turns out that that object is still there because, and the main reason for this is the symmetries that this distribution enjoys. Because if you take uh, this array and then you reorder the rows by arbitrary permutation, and you reorder the columns by arbitrary permutation, you end up with the same array in distribution. Okay. And how do you see these symmetries? Well, 
this symmetry under the permutation of the rows is obvious because here you're just reordering the replicas. So that, that's called replica symmetry. And the invariance under the permutation of the columns, this is um, because the, all the models that we are looking at, I mean, if you look at the definitions of all those Hamiltonians, the, the, these are what is called mean field models. So all coordinates are defined in the same, I mean, the role is the same, so if you reorder the coordinates there, you are not affecting the distribution of the Hamiltonian. So that's exactly what's happening here, and this is called symmetry between sides. Okay, so in mean field models, you get these uh, two symmetries automatically, and then, so this gives us some kind of two-dimensional analog of um, exchangeable sequences. So these are called exchangeable arrays. And there is an analog of definite representation for Right, I mean, if you just look at this as a distribution of, of, the distribution of the process will be invariant under the reordering of this, this whole vector. I mean, of course, of this whole vector of coordinates. So this is also mean field model in that sense. And so there is an analog of definite representation here, which is called Aldous Hoover representation, which says that which says that your array with those symmetries can always be generated by one function sigma of four coordinates on zero, one. In our case, with values in plus and minus one, because all our spins take values just plus and minus one. And then you plug in IID uniform random variables. So the first one does not depend on any coordinates. This is kind of a common randomness of the whole array. Yes? <coughs> oh, that's a good question. Yes, I'm kind of running, uh, skipping that, that part. So it's not clear in most models, yes, it's true that it's not clear that there is a unique limit. And there is only one class of models. So like if you look at these uh, mixed p-spin models, when all p are present, then we know there is a unique limit. But in general, we don't know that. And so what happens is we simply look at any, all sets of, or, I mean, the whole set of possible limits over subsequences, right? So because that's a, you know, by compactness, I mean, all the entries are bounded. You can have limits over subsequences. And so what turns out is that if you can prove that any limit has the structure that the physicists predict, then actually that's enough to recover the formula for the free energy. <coughs> Yes, because that's true for any, this is true for any limit over any subsequence. Right. Do you, can you say more in situations where the free energy is differentiable with respect to the parameters? So in the SK model and, and the mixed P-spin model, the free energy is differentiable in all beta P parameters. Oh, this is, this is exactly how you get uniqueness, yes. So you prove that, so after you prove the Parisi formula, then you show that the formula is differentiable in these parameters. And by taking derivatives, what you get is you get uh, information about the pth moment, which is the pth moment of the overlap because of this covariance so structure. Yes, but here you would have, so, any time your model has non-zero beta p, well, it doesn't matter. It's always differential in, in all of this beta p no matter what, but every time beta p is non-zero, this gives you, uh, from Parisi formula, you can read off a unique, you, you identify the pth moment of the overlap uniquely. And then if you 
have enough terms included here, you have enough moments, it uniquely identifies the distribution of the overlap, and that uniquely identifies the whole limit. Okay, so here what you do is you just plug in then the sequence that depends only on the replica index, only on the spin index, and then the last one is IID at every, so independent at every entry of the array. So these are all IID uniform on zero one. Okay, so any It's a function of, so you have a function of four coordinates on zero, one, and then you plug in, so for the, for the term with indices i and l, you plug in here ul and vi and xil. So these depend, the indices here depend on, on the you know, position in your array, but all these Sequences, they're all independent of each other and all independent over different indices, all uniform on zero, one. Does that make sense? confusing is the i dependent of just four variables, four continuous variables, No, no. So here, I'm just writing that the distribution of the whole array. So for IL entry of the array, so here for 1, 1, you would plug in U1, V1, X1, 1. Hmm? So that's what I wrote here. I say these are all independent, uniform, random variables on 0, 1. They are all independent for any choice of different indices and so on. You are also independent of the variables. All, all are independent, uniform random variables on zero one, independent for every different index, independent for every name of the variables and so on. Right. So you can, s yes? Oh, I'm taking the limit in distribution, yes. Right. It's, not a, it's not a local function, right? So, yes. so then does the limit actually tell you anything about the limits of the overlaps? Or? Well, of course, this is much stronger. To say the limit for the whole array, of course, you automatically get the limit for the overlaps. But why? Because if this is in the sense of the convergence, yes. then what are the continuous functions? They're just functions that are uniform. Or the overlap. No, the, over, the, number of set points, right? uh, the overlap is, a, is the overlaps, you can easily check it's also a continuous function. And in fact, okay, maybe I going a little bit ahead of myself, but yes, so no, it's, this is much stronger than just looking at overlaps. Here, of course, the information about overlaps is included, and you can see it, if, if it's not obvious, right away, you can see it just by looking at the moments. Well, let me just do something simple, like let's say I take an overlap and let's see that the square, the second moment converges, okay? So I, of course I'm using here the symmetry between sides also. So, and you can do the same, you can write any set of overlaps and see that their joint moment will converge. That's enough, right? So why this guy converges? Because when you multiply things out, you will have Okay, so what is written there is sum sigma 1, sigma 2, i, i squared. Now when you square out, let's forget about the diagonal terms when i is equal to j, right? Because those will be n of them and you divide by n squared. But for the terms where i is not equal to j, for a term of this type, so sigma 1, i, sigma 2, i, sigma 1 j, sigma 2 j, for any i and j, it's the same average. It's th so 
the expectation is the same by this by symmetry. No, no, of course, every, for every n, everything changes. The Gibbs measure is redefined for every n. So for every n, you have a new system. And I'm looking at the annealed average over there. Oh. Yes. And OK. The reason you need incremental replicas is to keep apart the regular and the sigma. Is that the, the idea of this construction? So all no, the sigmas are dropped independently, conditionally on the same g. Yes, but I look at the distribution of that array with, with respect to not conditionally on, on Gs, but just, just on the d final distribution of that thing. So first you generate random measure, then you sample, and just look what the distribution of the final result is. And the point is I need them because the free energy is, is a function of that thing. And in both of these models is some very nice function of, of uh, the distribution of, of, of that array. And then in addition, if I also have an extra structure that the physicists predict, then it gets even simpler. And I get this nice formula, like Parisi formula, for the free energy. And there is an analog of Parisi formula in the diluted case also. There is a Mizard Parisi formula here, but it's too complicated to write down here. OK? I, I, I'm still, I'm sorry, I'm still a little bit confused about this. I was Yeah, there, there exists, so there, yeah, there, there exists this function sigma. Maybe I should put it here. So for any exchangeable array, there exists a function that can be used to generate it like this. And, and the w, w is, uh, what, what is that for the uh, So this is also a uniform random variable on 0, 1. Mm -hmm. That just has no index, meaning it's kind of a common randomness of the whole array. This here is the randomness of the replicas. This here is the randomness of the spins. And this is kind of an individual randomness of each entry in the array. Perhaps the representation could be to make more pedagogical if you could present it for the definite. Yeah. For the definite. Before we go to other proof. Or we will see it in a second. So we will, we will see it just. We will see it in a second, the definitive version. I mean, it will, it's built into this one, but I'm saying at the same time. So the first thing I want you to notice is that this last coordinate is completely irrelevant to us. It carries no information because our values are plus and minus 1. So it's just like flipping a coin independently at every entry. All I need here is to keep the average with respect to x. So if I write down the sigma bar where I simply you know, average this guy with respect to x. Okay. If I keep this array, then we can generate this array just by flipping a coin with this average. So in our case, a function of three variables actually with values in minus 1, 1 encodes any limit. So any limit is encoded by this function sigma bar of three coordinates. And finally, I just want to say that we can now view this function in a geometric way as a Gibbs measure. So to do this, what, what I'm simply going to say is that let's think of this for any fixed two coordinates. Let's think of this as a function of the last coordinate. Then when we plug in IID uniform random variables here, now we are going to think of this as a sequence of replicas in the limit. So this will be now our, our new replicas in the limit. So this will be IID replicas from, from which measure? Well, it's obvious here the measure G, it will be just the image of the the back measure on 0, 1 by this map, u goes into this function of, of v, like this. So, right, so what I wrote here is, is the same, that plugging in uniform random variable, it's just like sampling from this measure. 
right? And this measure will be a measure on, I'm going to think of this as a measure on L2, on 0, 1. with respect to with, with the Lebesgue measure on the last coordinate v. And also, I will notice that, in fact, it's not just in L2, but this is bounded by 1. So it's also, in fact, inside the unit ball of L infinity. Okay, And that's what will be our template. This is what I will call asymptotic Gibbs measure. So let me maybe explain it backward. So what I'm saying is now we have this object, which will be a random probability measure, just like before the limit, only it will live on this space of functions instead of you know, finite vectors. It will live on L2. And when you sample from this measure, you simply get this sequence. And it's a random measure because it still depends on this, on this W. So this is the common randomness of the limit. So that's why this is a random measure. But when you sample from this measure, you just get this sequence of functions. So our replicas in the limit will be a sequence, you know, will be just a sequence of functions. And then once we produce this sequence of functions, how do we generate our array? Well, we just go back here and plug in IID uniform random variables into those functions. So each function will, you know, each random function will encode one row of, you know, spins. And this is just produced by plugging in VIs. Okay. If your sigma bar is checking variance minus one plus one only, or is it from the interval? So sigma, sigma bar is no, no, it's from, it's from minus one to plus one. It's on the interval. Well, the sigma bar, so it, can, let, let me say what the overlaps, if you want to know what the overlaps will become and the limit, let me write down what the overlaps will become and the limit. And that will explain why I chose L2. Because when, when you are in the unit ball of L infinity, you can choose any, you know, topology is the same to choose L1 or, but, L2 is simply because if you take an overlap between two replicas before you, before you pass to the limit, so that's an overlap between replica N, L, and L prime before the limit. You can easily check that this in the limit will become in distribution just the scalar product of these replicas those replicas in the limit. So you would, this gives you one replica. That's a function of V. You look at another replica by plugging in another uniform. That's again function of V. Their scalar product in L2 is exactly now the overlap in the limit. Sorry, DV, DV, DV. So, so we sample function, our Gibbs measure is now a measure on, on the space of functions, on L2 basically. And if you just want to know the overlaps, you only look at the scalar products between these functions. And so for this reason, in the SK model, that's all the information you want about the limit. You only, when you sample from this asymptotic Gibbs measure, you don't really care how these functions look like, you just want to know their distances. And that information encodes the free energy and you know, everything about the SK model. So for this reason, when I describe Parisian ZATs, I will only talk about this measure from the point of view of distances or scalar products. And I will say nothing about more specifically how these functions look like and what kind of you know, array you produce by this procedure. But in the diluted models, I, I will have to explain this extra step, how this array of spins. The content of the Aldous-Hoover is that any limit is encoded 
by this function of three variables. And you generate your array by sampling. If you think of it in this geometric way, you sample your functions, and then all you need to do is plug in IID uniform into those functions, and that will produce um, your array of speeds. Of course, you still have to flip the coins, but I'm ignoring that part. And you have to figure out the sigma is too, right? I mean, depending on your model, what your model depends. You, you need sigma to bar. know what sigma bar is, and uh, yes, so that, that's what I'm going to describe right now. Yeah. What, what, the, what the, you know. So th this is just a template to start our work. We have this geometric object in the limit because of the symmetries. Now, wh what do the physicists predict about this? about this Gibbs measure. I, I won't talk in terms of sigma bar. I will now focus on the Gibbs measure. We are not familiar with this, all this homework. In which Telerade, and what's the sort of mathematical home for this result? Here it is used probably in a very special way, but mm -hmm. there wasn't this general. Thing. Yes, you can, uh, you, can, you can make the array to be not just two-dimensional, but you know there could be you know, d-dimensional array, and you can have exchangeability in, in every coordinate. And you can also replace, so here had a special case when the values take plus and minus one, but it doesn't matter. The values take in any standard Borel space. Right. In the general case, the last coordinate, xil, it's not a dummy coordinate. You cannot throw it away in the general case. Here, when you have plus and minus one, you can immediately forget about it. Okay. So, let me start with the Parisi. What the Parisi ansatz predicts in the SK model. So, first of all, kind of a simple property, uh, but okay. This is what the physicists would call pure state picture. But basically, it just says that in the limit, when we look at this random measure, it will always live on, we are in L2, so this is a norm in L2. It will always live on a sphere of non-random constant radius with probability 1. So we had our Gibbs measure on the sphere. In the limit, it will still be on the sphere. It, it's, not, no, it's a non-random sphere for any realization. It's the same ra radius. Now, the, the most important you know, prediction, this geometric prediction of Parisi is the so-called ultrametricity, which says that the support of the Gibbs measure is ultrametric, set in this, in this space, which just means if you take three points in the support of this rep, random Gibbs measure for any realization of Gibbs measure, the distances between the points will satisfy ultrametric inequality, so this strong triangle inequality. Okay. So now, what is a good way to think about? There is a good way to think about this ultrametricity in a kind of a global way, as a property of the entire support of Gibbs measure, because you, you can notice that if you take any, you take any three points in the support of your Gibbs measure. So now I'm, I'm going to think that we are in the limit. We have a random measure on, on this space of functions. Support is on, on some sphere. Uh, sigma bar. Uh, well, no, because sigma bar is equivalent to G. You know, sigma bar is the whole function. It encodes the same information as the Gibbs measure. The replicas from the Gibbs measure, I will continue to denote them by sigma, like, like before the limit. And sigma now is a function. Yes, so from now on, replicas, so in the limit, the replicas, I will use the same notation as before the limit. So this is, you can think of this as the same as just plugging into, you know, so, but I will write the same notation and the overlap in the limit is just a scalar product, you know, in L2. That, that would be the overlap. 
in the limit. Okay. So I will also denote not only replicas, but just points in the support of Gibbs measure just by sigmas again. Is that all right? Each sigma is an infinite array. No, each sigma is a function in L2. So now the Gibbs measure lives here on, the, on this space of function. Now my sigmas are just functions. So before the limit, they were you know, vectors. And instead of keeping in the, thinking of them in the limit as an infinite vector, I, I think of them as just a function. Right? And when you sample a function like this, to produce that array that infinite array, you just have to plug in IID uniform into that function. Okay. Well, so what is the norm that you're using? Oh, th this is, so, uh, this is an L2. I mean, so, L2 is L1, 2, 3, right? Three dimensions. That's the norm. Three variables. Um, so, L2 is L1, 2, 3 dimensions. Why is it equal to L1? Oh, that's because I'm thinking of this as a function of only the last coordinate. So it's one dimension. And there was a unit. Okay. So once again, W, it's like generating, generating a random measure. U corresponds to sampling from the random measure. So when you plug in UL, IID, this is sampling from this random measure. So you are sampling functions of the last coordinate. And so the support of the random measure is just here. It's in L2. These are just now functions. So in the limit, we forget about any coordinates. We have a space of functions. So the norm is in, a, in L2. But is it the case here that basically in the limit, if you care about the, only the overlap between the different configurations, Exactly. Just the end, I mean, the L2 of 0, 1 happens to be a canonical version of the Hilbert space. Right. You, you're absolutely right. I mean, as I said, for the SK model, we only want to know their scalar products. So if you take your Gibbs measure, you can put it by isometry on any Hilbert space you like, because when you will sample, you will only look at scalar products. You don't need any other information in the SK model. I did this in this way because it also allows us to talk about diluted model, where you, know, you need to know how you will produce individual coordinates in, in the limit. Okay. Right, so here it's even stronger. The L infinity norm is bounded by one. So really I'm thinking about L infinity unit ball, but sitting inside L2 just because of this special you know, connection to the scalar product. To, to the geometry of L, to the geometry of L2. Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's an overkill to write L2 there, but uh, you know, it's, it's important because I'm just, I will really keep thinking of this as, as L2 because of scalar product and the norm. So how you can think of this globally, it's if you take any, any distance, any size for your neighborhood, and you say that for the points in the support of your Gibbs measure, so these are functions in L2, we will define a relation just by the condition that they are within distance R from each other. And you notice that ultrametricity makes this into equivalence relation. Right? Because if two distances are less than R, automatically the third distance between the third pair is less than R. So because it's an equivalence relation, the support of the Gibbs measure for any size of the neighborhood will break into equivalence clusters. And you should really think of this as a clustering, that you have these clusters so everybody inside is within distance R from each other, but clusters are separated by the distance R. And as you increase the radius, you know, some small clusters will collapse into a bigger equivalence clusters and so on. And so for this reason, the most common visual representation of the Parisi uh, solution is, 
is by this clustering tree. You should you, you look at the support of your measure and then you start, you know, making this tree that describes how all the points cluster at different distances. Now, before I make that picture, I, I also want to mention that here, the general case, so when you have ultrametricity, the general case, that means that the distances between points can take, let's say, some arbitrary, let's say, continuous set of values. The general case can be approximated, can always be approximated when you have ultrametricity. By discrete case, when the scalar products between points take only finitely many values. Okay, so if you take R plus one values, this is what is called R step replica symmetry breaking. And you can do it because you know when you when you have this clustering picture, you can simply discretize the distances when when you will record the clustering, and at most you introduce the little error epsilon, right? If they clusters in between two times when you record it, well, you know their overlap, their scalar product up to little epsilon. So you can discretize, and it's enough to describe how this Gibbs measure will look in this case, okay, because the general case is just approximation by in a very strong sense by, by these discrete uh, cases. So when you have a scalar product taking finitely many values, you can easily see that in this case, the Gibbs measure will be purely atomic. You know, the, it has to be purely atomic, so it will concentrate on some sequence of functions with, with some weights p alpha. So this sigma alpha, uh, I will index them by natural numbers to the power r, as we, we will see very natural thing to do here. These are just functions in L2, and this is exactly what the physicists call pure states. Okay. Everything here is random. The weights, because the measure is random, all these weights are random. And so when you take all your functions in the support, so these are the functions on the sphere like this. When you put these functions, then you start recording how they cluster. So you look at the closest possible distance. You know, maybe they cluster like this. Right. So that's just a neighborhoods of, of the points that corresponding to the closest distance. Then they will cluster, you know, and they will continue clustering until they are one big cluster, right? So here what I'm doing is, um, so I'm saying that if you take, let's say, two indices, and what the indices will be simply, um, or in fact, in the Parisian Zats, there will be, for e each vertex, every time a cluster breaks into subclusters, it actually breaks into infinitely many subclusters. So this will be infinitary tree. And for this reason, you just enumerate you know, the first level by natural numbers and so on until at the end you have natural numbers to the power r. So if you have a pure state, the leaf of this tree that will index pure states, that's just r natural numbers which tell you which turn you take as you start from the root, which turn you take to go to this leaf, right? You take this turn. And then N2 tells you, among the children, you take this turn. And so the index alpha actually encodes the whole path from the root to the, uh, to the leaf. And if you take any two pure states, let's say alpha and beta, and you want to know what their scalar product is, well, you just go to that place where they meet. This is usually denoted by the wedge notation. That's the level where they meet. And then sigma, so the scalar product between these two functions in these two pure states in L2, it will be whatever value, uh, 
whatever value the overlap can have at that level. So there will be Q at that level. So here you can imagine there is an axis where this is the smallest possible value for the overlap. And at the end, this is the largest possible value for the overlap, QR. And this is whatever, you know, QP is at this level. That tells you the, the scalar problem. Okay. So that describes completely the geometric picture from the point of view of distances or scalar products. Now everything is encoded by this tree, right? You, for any two points, you know exactly what their distance is. You can read it off from uh, this tree. And then what remains is to describe the probabilistic part of the picture. Namely, what are these random weights? Okay, so you have, you have this random sequence of weights and that's exactly what Ruel did in his paper. Okay? That's exactly what is given by the Ruel probability cascades. There, there is this very precise description how these weights will be generated. So l let me describe this quickly. So what you do is if you take any, okay, let me take this one. So if you take any vertex in this tree, first you so if this vertex is at the level P, you know, if this here you have QP, you pr generate a Poisson point process indexed by this vertex. It will be on the positive real line and you can enumerate the, you know, the points in this Poisson point process. You can enumerate them in the decreasing order. And this will be a Poisson point process with the mean measure given by some parameter zeta p x to the minus 1 minus zeta p dx on the positive half line, okay, on r plus. And zeta p here is just a cumulative distribution function for the overlap corresponding to that level p. So if you sample two points from your asymptotic Gibbs measure, Right, so you sample a pair, sigma 1, sigma 2. You just look at their overlap, which in the limit is a scalar product in L2. And you see what is the probability that this is less than or equal than QP. So it's just a cumulative distribution function for the overlap at this point, QP. So these values, QP, they will come with corresponding values you know, for, their, for the cumulative distribution function of the overlap. And these are the values you plug in here to, you know, define this mean measure of this Poisson point process. So you produce this Poisson point process and then what you do, the values, you distribute them among the children. So if this guy here is the child number n, then u beta n goes here. You assign uh, the value to the child And then finally, what you do is you say for a every pure state, you simply go from the root to the, that leaf alpha and at every vertex along the path leading to alpha, you plug in whatever the value appears in that vertex that you just generated. And finally, you just rescale them to make into a probability measure. Okay, and that's exactly the distribution, that's exactly how you produce the weights in this random measure. So Ruel g gave this very precise, you know, short description of, of the randomness part of this Parisi picture. So you can think of this, there is a geometric part given by ultrametricity and there is a probabilistic part given by this construction of, of the weights. Okay. So tomorrow I will try to uh, describe where where this is coming from. Now, I don't know if I have any time. Oh, yes, I still have some time. So what I want to describe today is what happens in the diluted models. 
So I mentioned that the Parisian ZATS plays a very important role if you start thinking about diluted models. Or maybe I, is it already 15 minutes after? <laughs> well, 